Hey you doing everyone, my name is Peter and I welcome you to the basement for, for another episode of 8 Bits in the Basement, if that makes sense. Anyway, this here is my 1530 dataset unit, freshly bought about three weeks ago from eBay. So I've thoroughly tested it out and it's working great, but I thought what we'd do today was we would have a little look at it and we'd see what it is exactly. This here is what we got. We've got the 1530 dataset unit from Commodore. And this here is what the 1530 data set unit looks like. Now my history with this unit is kind of long and is kind of love-hate type thing because back in the 80s when I had my Commodore 64 it was my main only computer that we had in the house this was the only way we had to put software onto it and also to save any little programs that I had written or whatever onto the blank cassette and I remember that sometimes it worked great and other times it was it was really a pain to be quite honest about it because I remember buying cassettes coming home putting them in trying to load them they wouldn't work bring them back to the guy in the shop saying there's a problem with this cassette they'd try it in the shop in front of me and it would work and it always baffled me as to why that was it's only recently I figured out why well I didn't figure out I was told why and I figured I would um, I, well we'd, we'd have a go and see see uh, how hard that problem was to solve because I mean at the time nobody had a clue there was no internet and in magazines they didn't really speak about that so um, yeah no for the sake of this episode I figured what we do is we'll have a little look at this unit we'll open it up have a look on the inside have a little chat about um, what it is and how it differs from a regular cassette player and yeah, and we'll move on from there and see what's what. So here we are anyway. We've got our 15, this is actually a 1530 model C2N data set. And it is capable of recording and also uh, loading games onto your, uh, onto your Commodore 64 or C16 or VIC-20 or C128. And uh, the keys, or the keys are the buttons more so. We've got our eject, our stop, fast forward, rewind, play and record. So nothing different from a regular tape recorder. Also, we've got a, a counter here to let us know what position we're at in the tape. And there's a little lead here to let us know when we're saving to a blank cassette or whatever. So that is pretty much that. Our eject mechanism works as such. And there are no actual inputs like... Um, a line in or a mic in or a headphone out or any of that it's connected using this little proprietary Commodore connector into the back of your computer and um, it's also got a little ground lead on it now I never knew what this lead was for because this sticker for some reason wasn't on the data set that I had and it explains here that it's a ground cable that's only to be used in the US and it is to comply with FCC regulations. So actually there's no need for it here in Europe. It can be snipped off. But I'm going to leave it on it because it's not doing any harm tied up there the way it is. Anyway, I digress. What we're going to do is we're going to open this guy up. We're going to have a look on the inside and we're going to see what, what exactly it is. So turning it around the back here like this, we'll see that there are just four screws holding the whole lot together. So we will flip those out and see what's what. Okay, so once we've removed our four screws, this guy is kind of a clamshell type thing. So um, really there's only four screws holding the entire thing together. And within it, we've got our mechanism here. And to remove the mechanism, all we have to do is grab it and remove it from the lower shell like that so there we are this here is our little our little drive mechanism so what we're looking at is we're looking at a motor here which does what a motor does it drives the actual tape for a fast forward rewind and play and uh, we've got our counter here with the button so as the tape turns it's in the other sense the tape turns we've got um, the counter that clocks up here because this little belt here is driving it and then our button will reset it back to zero so there we go that's working great and that little belt looks to be in good condition too this here is our save lead when we are saving programs 
this guy will light up. Let us know that it's, I suppose, record is pressed, really. And um, within it here, what we've got is we've got two heads. We've got the white one here, which is the erase head. So what that does is that blanks the tape before it arrives here at the read-write head before that is written to it. So really, this head here is only used if you're saving to blank whatever information is on the cassette before new information is written to it. And this guy here also, as it's a read-write head, it'll also read information from a cassette and send it back to the Commodore as well. So these are two parts that really would need to be cleaned with a little alcohol or whatever, uh, just to make sure that they are clean and making good contact with the magnetic tape and whatever, so that it is working well. Um, what else is there? Okay, so around the back here, we've got our main drive belt. So that's this guy here. And this is the motor, and as the motor turns, uh, our main drive belt here is turning these, these two uh, cogs or wheels here. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what that does to drive the little motor. And I'm not sure, to be absolutely honest with you, what the heck this cog here does. But anyway, um, here. Now, this guy here is interesting. Because what this guy here is, is the circuitry that um, makes all this stuff kind of work in a way. There's one major difference between this and a regular cassette recorder that you would have bought at the time, like the the Spectrum would have used a regular cassette recorder. And the reason for that is that the ZX Spectrum had built onto its motherboard a little piece of circuitry that could convert digital signals to analog and analog to digital. But Commodore 64 was missing that by design from its motherboard. And Commodore decided that they would include that little piece of circuitry in their data set. So that was the reason why you could only use a Commodore data set with a Commodore 64. Because if not, there was no way that the processor would get a digital signal from an analog source or be able to con convert a digital signal to an analog signal in order to save it onto a cassette. So all that was done here on the data set. And if I can just gently remove, remove these cables for you, you may be able to see what it is made up of on the underside. So what we have on the board here is we've got a 74LS14, we've got two 6562s, there's one here and one here, and then the rest is really resistors and capacitors. I've got two electrolytic capacitors here which don't seem to be bulging or anything, so that's good. And I've also got two little flag type capacitors and there are three ceramic capacitors there and then a whole heap of little resistors. But that's basically what this board here is made up of. And this is the guy that does all the digital to analog conversion. Now, also another thing that I found quite interesting is that this guy here, the little connector here, has got a load of little ferrite beads, one around each cable to stop uh, reflections and all the rest from one to the other, which, um, which I've never seen before, a kind of little bouquet of, of ferrite beads. So yeah, so that's an interesting little one. So um, that's basically that's basically that. Now I didn't do anything with this. There's plenty of grease all around here already, so I didn't put any more on it because, well, to be honest, I don't have any. And as I say, the belts that are in it look to be in good condition. They don't seem to be too stretched or anything. And using it, it works away fine. So I haven't touched any of that. So. I was thinking what we do is we'll throw it back together and we will just have a look at it functioning. Now, so this guy is wide open in front of me, so I'm going to take this opportunity to talk to you about the azimuth. And that was a source of pain and woe for a lot of us back in the day. It was the reason that you bought a game, brought it home, it didn't work, went back to the store with it, said this game doesn't work and then looked like a complete idiot when it worked on the seller's computer. And the reason for it is this, there is a little screw here that can be adjusted on the read-write head. You'll notice that the record head has two screws and they've got nut lock on them, this little kind of red nail varnish sheet type stuff to stop the screws from moving. And there's only one has nut lock on the read-write head. 
This guy here can be adjusted and it is the azimuth adjustment screw. Now what the azimuth does is pretty much this. If you can imagine the magnetic tape as it moves in front of the read right head, really by rights, the two of them should be parallel, completely parallel. But what can happen over time, or if it's mal adjusted in the factory, is that the read right head can be slightly off in one way or the other uh, in relation to the tape that's running across. So what will happen if it's not parallel is you'll get little read errors and these translate into load failures. So this little screw here will allow you to adjust the azimuth so that it will be completely parallel and you won't get any load failures. And that was the problem we had back in the day. But there was very little information about it. I mean, these little manuals that came in didn't speak about the azimuth adjustment at all. And in magazines and whatever, it was mentioned from time to time, but I never saw an article on it. So that was the reason why it was only about a year or two ago that I even, that I even heard of this particular thing. But um, the adjustment of it is quite easy if you have the right tools to do it. And I don't mean a screwdriver, but I mean something that will tell you exactly how aligned it is one way or the other because it's minuscule and you won't be able to see it by eye. Now, there are one or two ways of doing it. You can do it with an oscilloscope and make a few connections on this board here around the back. And then there is an azimuth alignment cassette that you can get that'll play a frequency of 27 or 37 megahertz, I think. And you can use your oscilloscope to find the peak, the best point as you're adjusting this little screw. Or, thankfully, if you don't have all that, uh, there are programs on the Commodore 64 itself that you can load up using a cartridge and you can actually adjust the azimuth that way and get the best point or near enough the best point that it'll work. One other thing just before, if you've taken your little data set apart and you want to clean it thoroughly, it comes apart fairly easily, but this little guy here to take this cover off I'll just show you, it's, it's, it's not hard to do at all. Give it a little push here. These two guys here, you just push in and blap, off it comes. It shouldn't come off that violently, but off it comes. And to put it back in, offer it back up here like this. Make sure, make sure that the gap across the top here is closed. And you can just with a little force, reclose. And there we go. <laughs> That's the way that that works. Okay, so I'm back out here in front of the Commodore 64 and I'm after connecting the old C64 up to the TV using RF because that leaves the composite connection available to connect to my capture card and let you see what's going on much more clearly right about here. Now, so what I've done is the data set is after being connected to the Commodore 64 in the usual normal way. And you remember just about a second ago, we were speaking about the azimuth and the way we could adjust it. So I'll show you I'll show you how to do that. So you don't actually have to take the data set apart at all to adjust the, the azimuth. You'll see that just over the second M in this Commodore logo here, there's a little hole. And this little hole will allow you to put in a PH00 screwdriver like this and adjust that little screw one way or the other to align the azimuth. So you can make it tighter or looser. But that's all well and good. But Unless we have a visual representation of whether we're making it better or worse, we don't really know what exactly we're doing. So thankfully, there's after been a number of programs written for the Commodore 64 that will show us on screen whether we're aligning it correctly or whether we're going a little further away from where we should be. Now, to load these up, you load them up in, in a regular, regular fashion. You can use the data cassette, although this may be a little problematic if the azimuth is fairly far out of whack or you can use a modern likes of Kung, Kung Fu flash cartridge or uh, any of the other cartridges that will allow you to load up programs on the Commodore 64. But today what I'm going to be using is my 1541 disk drive because I haven't used it in quite some time. So um, I'll just load up the little program and then I'll show you how it works. Okay, so here we are, we're after loading up our cassette asthma checking program. So all of the links and whatever are in the description below for this. But in order to use it, it says what you need to do is to insert the tape and press play. 
and then you tighten the azimuth screw completely and then you need to loosen it until the data is visible as clear lines. So that doesn't make too much sense right now, but you'll see once we start using it. The first thing that you need to have, you really need to have a cassette uh, that has a program for a Commodore computer on it. Now, I got this cassette, which is for the VIC-20, with the data cassette drive, so it kind of worked out well for me, but all we need to do is to insert the cassette into the data set and press play. Now, so you see that there's, um, there's a line coming down the screen and now there's a whole blodge of like little ants all over the screen. So what we need to do is we need to adjust that little azimuth screw until we have three or four uh, clean distinguished lines on the screen here. So the azimuth screw is only available when you press play. So I'll put this little screwdriver down in here and try and find the screw which for some reason eludes me. There we go. Now, and just turning that screw, you'll see that I can get a point where the lines are straight, but they're also kind of thin, at the thinnest point. And that is where the azimuth should be best. And that's basically all that's to it. Um, that's pretty much it. The azimuth should now be aligned on that fairly well and it should be able to load pretty much any program that you throw at it. Okay everyone, I'm afraid we're just after doing the azimuth on this thing and we're ready to see will it work, but I'm going to have to call this a day on this particular episode. Uh, I'd like to, for the future, keep episodes about 10 to 15 minutes long and already I've gone way over. Uh, the reason for that is I want to be able to turn them out quicker and edit them quicker and that way maybe I can get a video out a week which I'd really love to be able to do but um, yeah for the moment I'm going to have to call it a day on this so what we've done is we've looked at it we've tested the azimuth in the next episode what I'd like to do is we'll just check and see is it working properly and also I would like to see about downloading um, tap files and that kind of stuff from the web converting them over to WAV or some type of audio file and throw them onto a blank cassette and see if we can get games to load up on the C64 from the data cassette or the data set drive. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the plan for next week, I suppose. So look, if you enjoyed this episode, give us now a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know the thing is the thumbs down one. I appreciate any comments I get. And if you haven't done so already, click the subscribe button. Thanks very, very much for watching. I know your time is valuable and thanks for passing it with me here in the basement. We'll talk to you again next time. <laughs> Until then, take care of yourselves and see you all soon. Bye bye.